Huh. If you put the US government and Dave Ramsey, the man that hates that more than anybody in the world, on a call together, I wonder what a funk of recession would come out of it. The US national debt has been growing by about $1 trillion every 100 days, or roughly 3.6 trillions per year. Yes, you heard that right. We're adding a cool trillion to the debt pile every few months. And this is the fastest rate of increase ever seen in a developed country. As of the end of October, the US owes 36 trillions. So wherever you're tuning in from, it's probably time to start wondering how this is gonna affect the US, the global economy, and, oh, here's the fun part, your investments in the US stock market. Because let's be honest, the market doesn't exactly love it when that skyrockets. In this video, we'll dive into how this ever multinational debt is slowly and silently killing the US economy and what it means for our future. Buckle up, it's going to be a wild ride. Now imagine the US government as a big company, a really, really poorly managed company. Like any company, it has money coming in and money going out. Money flows in from taxpayers, like you, and flows out to cover expenses like military, healthcare, infrastructure, social security and education. So when a government spends more than it earns, national debt is created by borrowing to cover the spending. To put it in simple terms, the government is basically an American teenager with a credit card. When you hear people talking about a $36 trillion national debt, there are two main components of this debt public debt and intragovernmental debt. Public debt is what the government owes to others, like individuals, companies, or foreign countries like China or Japan. Intragovernmental debt is money that governments owe to themselves, like to social security and other trust funds. Now, of the $36 trillion that the government owes, around 29 trillions are owed to others, while the rest is a government's IOU to itself. It's like saying, don't worry, future me will pay this off. So now is the tricky part. Unlike a company with debt that might cut back on spending and increase prices, like Elon Musk when he bought Twitter and fired 80% of the staff, the government can't exactly fire Americans to reduce spending. Otherwise, we'd be living in a real life version of the purge. We should better stay in a movie, right? Now, if we wanna be good and cut the US government some slack, managing the United States is no small thing. It's like, trying to run a massive corporation where everyone is your boss and none of them agree on anything. The government has to fund essential services like schools, social security, Medicare, and healthcare. With an aging population that's having fewer kids, there's a problem. We don't have enough people in the workforce to pay for all the baby boomers' retirement. If we don't make enough people to at least sustain our numbers, perhaps increase a little bit, then civilization's gonna crumble. To make it worse, beside normal spending, the government needs to respond to emergencies like wars, recessions, or epidemics. In 2020, the US had to spend trillions to provide stimulus checks, unemployment benefits, and support for small businesses, only to face COVID-19, also known as the stay home and watch Netflix virus. When a government cuts taxes, it gets less revenue, which also increases debt. The Trump tax cuts of 2017 were certainly good news for many and brought an initial boost in economic growth, but they also increased the deficit. So the US keeps borrowing and the debt grows bigger. So you see how growing debt is like a snowball. The bigger it is, the harder it is to stop it. So when the big debt ball has grown to a critical level, we wonder, how is this going to impact the economy maybe even your morning cup of coffee. When you want to picture the US economy with a lot of debt, think about yourself after a big Thanksgiving dinner, full and slow. In 2024, the US is expected to spend hundreds of billions of dollars just on interest payments. That's money that could have gone to schools, healthcare, or infrastructure. But instead, it's being used to pay past borrowing. As that grows, more money goes towards paying interest rather than fueling growth. So. Good luck trying to grow like that. It's like running a marathon in cement shoes. If you ever wondered why these potholes in your street aren't fixed, or why school textbooks still reference the Soviet Union, well, it's because the budget is too tight to fund much beyond that. At this rate, we're gonna have to start a Kickstarter just to build a bridge or fund space exploration. Help NASA get back to the moon, please. Pledge $10 today. Here's a fun thought, or a dangerous one. The US debt is like a ticking bomb. At some point, if the debt gets too big, investors might lose faith in the government's ability to pay it back. They could start demanding higher interest rates to compensate for the risk, 
making it even more expensive for the government to borrow. Imagine if your credit card company suddenly decides you're not trustworthy and jacked up your interest rate to 25%. You'd probably start panicking. And that's exactly what could happen to the US if a debt crisis hits. But no worries, we'll just ask China, Japan, and all the other countries lending us money to keep calm and carry on forever. And if that doesn't work, no worries, we can just raise taxes. After all, who doesn't love paying taxes? Well, brace yourself, because if the debt keeps growing, future generations will likely face higher taxes or fewer government benefits, or maybe even both. This is what we call passing a buck, though it feels more like tossing a grenade over the wall. So either Uncle Sam will come by and raise your taxes, or you will cut spending. That means bye-bye Social Security, Medicare, education funding, and other services. You know, all these things people kind of like having. But wait, we can print money. Everything is good as long as the US can print money, <laughs> like there's no tomorrow. Only there is tomorrow, and so there is inflation. You know, Price is going up, but dollars not stretching as far. It's like running on a treadmill. You're moving, but you're not getting anywhere. On the bright side, you can start telling stories like, back in my days, a cappuccino at Starbucks used to cost $6. We thought that was expensive. And your future grandchildren will roll their eyes and say, really, grandpa? I just bought one for $500. You see, the US, in the short term, definitely benefits from that. It keeps the machine running, but in the long term, it has only to lose even its own reputation. The US has always been seen as a safe bet when it comes to lending money, like the rich classmate that lends you the money for the half-break snack. But if the debt keeps growing, the US could lose that AAA credit rating, the financial world's version of a five-star Yelp review. If that happens, it becomes more expensive to borrow, higher interest rates, fewer investors, and the US dollar losing more of its prestige as the world's reserve currency. Because remember, a man is only as good as his worth, and a country is only as good as its AAA credit rating. The last but probably more tedious problem with owing money to other countries is that they have leverage on you. Imagine if you owe your neighbor money, and now they get to call the shots on what color you paint the house. The more debt we owe to other countries, the more influence they have on our policies. On the plus side, at least if things go south, we might all have a new national language to learn. Yes, I've always wanted to learn Chinese. Mmm, kind of. But wait, Rick, that is good because without that, there is no economic growth. So what are you talking about? Ah, uh, the classic counter-arguments. Let's break down the main key points with a little reality check. The United States can print money. We just need to print more money to cover that. After all, we literally control the supply of dollars. Right? Mm, yes and no. While printing dollars sounds like a magical solution, it's a bit like using a garden hose to put out a forest fire. Printing money leads to inflation, which is basically the government saying, we fixed the debt, but now your money is worthless. So unless you're excited about paying $50 for a gallon of milk, maybe let's not print our way out of this one. That isn't really a problem because interest rates are low. We're borrowing money at 3-4% per year. Ah, the credit card trick. Interest rates won't stay low forever. And when they eventually go up, and they will, it's going to be like that moment when your 3% APR credit card suddenly flips to 29% and you realize, oh, I actually have to pay this back. At this point, I'll be paying through the nose just to cover interest. Never mind the principal. But seriously now, borrowing is cheap now, so why not rack up that national debt? After all, what could possibly go wrong when interest rates rise? It's not like it has ever backfired in history. Oh, wait. Well, but actually we owe money to ourselves, right? The US owns money to its own citizens, to social security funds, and to domestic investors. Ladies and gentlemen, this is going to become the typical case of family long gone wrong. Yes, a part of the national debt is owed by the country itself, around 20%. Still, this doesn't mean it's not real. It's like saying, it's fine if I eat this entire cake because I baked it myself. Spoiler alert, you still had to pay for the ingredients. Ah, come on, other countries have higher debt and they're fine. This is the typical keeping up with the Jonas's argument. Take Japan, which has a much higher debt to GDP ratio than the US and hasn't exploded into an economic apocalypse yet. If Japan is doing fine with sky high debt, why can't we? Well. Japan's situation is unique. 
they have a high savings rate and most of their debt is held by their own citizens, making them a bit of an outlier. Plus, Japan has been dealing with low economic growth and deflation for decades, so maybe they're not the best role model here. What do you think? Well, okay, I get it. But as long as the economy grows faster than the debt, we are fine, right? This is, by the way, what some economists argue, and there's a lot of truth in it, but also a lot of optimism. The argument is that as long as the economy grows faster than the debt, the debt will shrink in relation to the overall size of the economy. True. A growing economy can offset some of the debt burden, but economic growth isn't guaranteed. If a new COVID comes, a recession, or even trade wars, the economy might not grow as fast as we hope, but the debt is not going to go anywhere. All right, but we've had debt forever and we're still here. This reminds me of my grandma when her television set broke down and she told me, that's so weird. It always worked until five minutes ago. Yes, the US had had debt for a long time. It's like a family tradition, right? Except instead of a holiday roast, it's a mountain of IOUs that we pass down to future generations. But we are not talking about a couple of bucks now. We're talking trillions. And as it grows, so do the risks. Just because something hasn't caused a crisis yet, doesn't mean it never will. So after dragging you through the endless pit of doom and gloom that is the US national debt, let's switch gears and let's talk about solutions. Yes, because there is actually hope. Sort of. And if we can figure out how to make avocado toast an international sensation, well, surely we can fix the national debt, right? One obvious way to tackle the debt is to raise taxes. After all, if you're not bringing in enough money, maybe time to, you know, bring in more money. This is probably the simplest and most painful way to generate more revenue. But who likes taxes? Nobody. No politician wants to run on the platform of vote for me and I'll make sure that you pay more. So that's why sometimes the idea comes out to have richer people pay more taxes. Because even if they pay more, they can still afford basic needs. But the truth is, it's impossible to tax rich people because there are too many ways to legally avoid paying taxes. And listen, I don't blame rich people. They just know the tax code. And if raising taxes sounds unpleasant to you, wait for what comes next. Let's cut government spending. Cutting government spending is like taking candy from a toddler. It's necessary, but expect a tantrum. Are you gonna eat this whole thing? Most likely not. <laughs> Some suggest cutting defense spending, but with global tensions, that's like asking a bodybuilder to skip leg day. Do you know you're supposed to work out your lower body too? Others point to programs like Social Security and Medicare, but then you're telling seniors, Hey, remember the things that we promised you? Well, yeah, about that, there is also talk about cutting so-called wasteful spending, which is a wonderful thing, don't get me wrong, but finding waste in a $6 trillion budget is like finding a needle in a haystack, except the haystack is also on fire and the needle keeps moving. Or maybe we can just grow the economy faster, then the debt problem would magically shrink. This is the equivalent of hoping your salary doubles next year so you can finally afford that Mercedes you bought on credit. But as we said before, economic growth isn't guaranteed, in the long and in the short term. Now, the Federal Reserve has done a good job fighting inflation, keeping rates low, and recently we finally had our first rate cuts. But there is no guarantee it will stay this way forever. Every solution you find to try and reduce the debt in one way or another damages the US against the rest of the global economy. There is one solution though that Warren Buffett proposed and it's sweet, simple, and practicable. Let's hear it from him. I get in the deficit in five minutes. How? You just pass a law that says that anytime there's a deficit of more than 3% of GDP, all sitting members of Congress are ineligible for re-election. Yeah, yeah. Now, now you've got the incentives in the right place, right? So it, it's capable of being done. Yeah, this sounds amazing in theory, but it's about as realistic as your New Year's resolution to go to the gym every day. Governments are used to borrowing to fund things, and balancing the budget will require tough political choices, either cutting spending or raising taxes, neither of which are popular. Fixing the national debt problem is hard, but if the US can make some tough decisions, whether it's cutting spending, reforming entitlements, or boosting economic growth, there is a chance we can get this under control. It's going to take political will, long-term thinking, and probably some serious compromise. And if all else fails, at least we have front row seats to the greatest economic roller coaster of all time.